Hello everybody, my name is Dustin Thompson with Delaware United. We are here today with Tizzy Lockman, who yep. is running for State Senate in Senate District 3, which yep. is in Wilmington, right? That's right, thank All you right. for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Sure. So tell us a little bit about your background, your, your history okay. with Delaware. All right, where do you want me to start? So I grew up uh, on the west side of Wilmington. I actually live to this day in the home that I grew up in, 9th and Franklin Street. I went to Red Clay Public Schools, so Lewis Elementary, which is right there in sort of the heart of, of the district. I went to HB Middle School and AI High School and, um, you know, pretty pretty standard upbringing. My, my dad actually was a journalist, a political journalist in Wilmington. So yeah, we've heard um, his name at the doors. Norm like, oh, is that, Yeah, is that yep. Norm's daughter? I'm one of his three daughters, and uh, so definitely grew up a little bit in his shadow, which was something that drove me crazy when I was a kid, but something I'm really proud of now. So I like getting to talk about him and talk about that. And uh, so, so yeah, so I grew up on the west side of Wilmington and uh, ended up going away sort of the end of high school and, and college and traveled and all that good stuff. But I came back in 2003 when I had my daughter, Sophie, who's now 14. And, uh, you know, just dove right back in. I always knew that I would come back, I think, on some level after I sowed my, my wild oats a little bit. And I did. And there's... So how did we get into that and then <laughs> serving on like the WIA commission and getting more involved oh boy. in education, well, PTAs? So that was part of it. I said I would say that was half of it. I was working with these kids from, you know, a lot of them were from Southbridge, uh, East Side, going to those schools there. And I was working with them in the summertime doing these camps. And I thought they were all brilliant kids. We were making these great videos. It was funny. It was fun. And then I would talk to them about their school experience. And I would sort of hear these, you know, surprising to me horror stories. Because I had had this very rosy, ideal public education experience uh, growing up in probably some of the same schools, to be honest. And so that was, that was a wake-up call for me at, but at, at how much things had changed. And at the same time, of course, I was raising my small child. And in 2008, she was kindergarten age, and it was time to put her in school. And I had, you know, another wake-up call experience where I was putting her into public elementary school 10 years after I had graduated from our public schools in Delaware and realized that a lot had changed in 10 years. And... Um, you know, there was, it was a stark difference in terms of how much our schools had resegregated was probably the first thing I noticed about them. And, and the level of poverty that was growing, particularly in schools in the city of Wilmington. So I, you know, I just got involved. I really care. Obviously, I love my, my daughter to death, and I really cared about the kids that I was working with, and I just wanted to understand what was happening. And so my first line of, of defense against this situation was just to, like, be the PTA mom. And so I ended up doing all that PTA work with some really inspiring uh, folks who had a lot of perspective on what might be going wrong. And together we started looking at our school district and seeing what policies had been set in place uh, by the district and on the state level that might have created this very different landscape of schools than what I had experienced growing up. So that was really the catalyst for me. I started getting more outspoken about what I saw that seemed unfair and just weird at, at how things had changed. And first thing, I was asked to join the board of the American Civil Liberties Union, which I did, I guess that's now almost about eight years ago. So that was, was one thing. And I, you know, when you're young and enthusiastic as I was 10 years ago, and um, you know, you get asked to do a lot of these things. So I said yes to a lot of stuff like that. I joined the Commission for Women and you know, I was just getting really on fire about the change that we could make around education policy. It seemed so doable. Um, and so I, I actually decided to change careers and I left my job as a producer and went back to, to graduate school at UD to get my urban affairs and public policy degree. I got an MA, so research oriented degree and wanted to just focus on, on what had changed in the schools. We struggle with revisiting things and getting it right in like a, a way where we're doing some fundamental reforms. And so with WIAC, I think we were trying to be bold about it. We were trying to say, look, it, it's governance, it's funding. We have to tackle that stuff or everything else that we do is going to be resting on this unsteady foundation. And I was very proud that, that we, we approached it that way because I think we, we were, I think we were able to catalyze conversations 
about that that are more purposeful than they were before. And I think without the all the research that we were able to do through the commission, I don't think there would be uh, the lawsuit that the ACLU filed against the state to say, look, this funding system is broken and we've got to do something different. We've got to do better by, by our kids. What we need to do in education policy and other policies is not just be, you know, a dog chasing our tail or just sort of running away from like, what is the real fundamental problem and how can we and it's gonna have to be some it. big changes you know a lot of times yeah. in, in politics and in policy we do incrementalism we it's do safe right we, we do find a safe incrementalism and I'm a believer but in that to some extent some things you have to do that way right otherwise you have huge negative externalities right. that you just can't predict right but when you have an inherent flaw in a system like we do with education funding exactly sometimes you're going to take a bold move mm -hmm. like a change, lawsuit yeah and then the process and then of course i mean the win for that although who knows what the timeline is going to be i mean we have some sense of what it'll be and it's not immediate but um you know that's not the courts aren't going to tell us what to do they're, i mean they're going to tell us this needs to be fixed. They're yeah. not going to say what's the best mechanism. And there's right. a thousand examples across the country of different ways to do it. But ultimately, that responsibility falls to our legislators. Yeah. And so, you know, with all that I've learned and studied in education funding, which is, you know, not the most exciting, but it's so important. And I find it fascinating. I, I think that's a big that's a big motivator for me to yeah. want to be. You are you know, uniquely qualified Dover. for that. I'm ready. Decision. I'm like, let me, <laughs> let me, add, let me add the funding yes. formula. So, um, yeah, I'm very excited about the idea of potentially being down there. And it is, it's very complex, uh, if it's not something that you dwell on a lot. And so, you know, I think that's something that has been part of that inertia in Dover.